Um, I hope you'll understand what I'm going to say to you. I'm not bragging, but I need uh, your prayers. Most of you know I walk the mall every, every day except Sunday, and I've got somebody, uh, one of the men there, to walk with me and so forth and so on, and giving out tracts and so forth. I've had people cuss me out. I've had uh, giving tracts out to people, and I go back around, they threw it on the ground or whatever. That doesn't bother me. I just want to keep right on going because I want to see, uh, to see results. And so today, I was over there, and I was walking around with this gentleman, and we came to one of the new booths that's there. There was this young lady standing there well-dressed and selling for this company for whatever it was, and so we were standing there talking. And my buddy said to her, this is uh, Pastor Buford, Gospelite Baptist. And she said, Baptist? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, where is it? And I told her where it was. And she said, you know, I've moved into the area. I'm looking for a church. And if I, if I, I think I'm off Sunday, if I can get off, I'll be there. If not, I'll try to get there on a Sunday evening or a Wednesday evening. And she seemed very serious about it. She wasn't just, you know, blowing smoke. So uh, that's one of the things that I try to do every day at the mall is walk around, give out tracts, and witness to folks. And there are other ways that you can do it. But here's what I basically want you to do is to pray for those tracts when they go out that they'll be used for the glory of the Lord. And I know you've already been doing it, and I know that you'll continue to do it, okay? All right, let's stand, have a word of prayer. Brother John, you come on to the platform. Father, bless our brother. Guide him with his thoughts and help him to preach the word with power. And I pray that uh, the messages as it goes out uh, will go out to the world. And, of course, we know that uh, these uh, services are being uh, cast over, uh, over the Internet, and people are seeing it and hearing it. We pray that there will be souls saved as a result. We thank you for our brother, and we pray you'll bless him. Pray that you will give us wisdom now for the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Bless thank you, you preacher. God bless amen. you. Well, it's so good to be back. So good to see each and every one of you. Hope you've had a... a we turn to a famous scripture in Matthew 28. 18 to 20, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. I want to look tonight at the subject, Third Millennial Missions. And um, thank you for your prayers. It's been a, a wonderful day. Got up, got in late last night, got up early this morning, had a funeral in Hartsville at 11, and um, conducted that funeral. I had two saved. It was a blessing. The daughter of the lady, she was 84, that went on to be with the Lord, and her daughter got saved, and then a, an older gentleman got saved. And he came to me after the service, tears in his eyes. He said, thank you, I really, really needed that. And both of them, and able to give them my, my gospel tract, this guy, not only the gospel in it, but some follow-up information, got them in touch with the pastor there in town and, and um, to keep that going. And then uh, while I was going to the funeral, um, one of my dear saints of God called, and her husband just passed away. At, at 8 o'clock this morning, and um, he was 90 years old. And um, he came to our church. He, my son actually was there, this was years ago, in the parking lot, and he pulls up. This, this guy's an African-American, retired veteran, just, I mean, just a wonderful, wonderful man. He said, do y'all accept black people here? And he, John said, most certainly we do. We got all kind of nationalities in our church. We got four families from the country of Burma, Myanmar. And all, all brands, you know, Hispanics and all that stuff. But anyway, so he came, he got saved, and he, he and his girlfriend then, they were living together. And, and so I was able to perform the ceremony and married them in their house. And they've just been so faithful. And, and, but he, um, <clears throat> Sunday a week ago, this organization makes quilts for veterans that represents their military service. And, um, and so they presented Joe, Joe Cole his, and he's 90. They presented my daddy one. My dad's 90 years old. He'll be 91 January the 30th. And um, uh, Pearl told me, so after I left the funeral, I went directly to her house to, to be with her. I'd called one of my deacons, and he and his wife went and be with her so she wouldn't be alone. And so I got there, and, and we were talking about the service, and, and she told me, she said, um, you know, Joe told me when he got that quilt, he said, now, honey, when I go to be with the Lord, I want to be buried in that quilt. Isn't that precious? And I said, and she said, I'm trying to figure out what to, what to put, put on him for the, for the funeral. I said, hey, naked came he into the world, naked shall he leave. 
I said, just, just wrap them in that quilt. That's what he wants. And, um, and but, but coming back from the funeral, uh, one of my other veteran men passed away today. Had two deaths today. So I got a funeral Monday at 11, and Joe's is Tuesday at 12, and had a funeral today. And so we need to stop this. We need to start birthing people. Amen. But uh, that's part of the ministry. It's a great opportunity to preach the gospel. Let me say, if you haven't yet filled out your commitment card for your faith promise, please do so. There's a few extra left up here. Hopefully, it'll be gone. all of them will be gone by Sunday. And uh, turn it into pastor or put it in the offering basket so that pastor and deacons will know how to plan for missions for this coming year. And then just do your best for Jesus. That's a great song. That's a convicting song. And um, do your best. And commit weekly or monthly. But then I want to encourage you to consider giving a sacrificial gift to missions. You'll never outgive the Lord. Just not going to do it. You try it and it just won't. Um, R.G. Letourneau, who invented these massive earth-moving machines that you see all over the world. A wealthy man. He made a commitment years and years and years ago. He wanted to get to the place where he was given 90% back to God, living off of 10%, but giving 90% of his income to God. And he does that now. Great testimony. One of his business partners said, R.G., I don't understand it. How can you give 90% of your income, live off of 10%, and you have more money today than you've ever had? And I love his simplistic response. He said, well, all I know is I just shovel it out to God. God shovels it back to me. God's shovel is just bigger than mine. Isn't that neat? And that's so true. You'll never explain the ability and the wonderful blessing of God's provision until you get extravagant in your giving. And so I encourage you, fill out your commitment card. Don't forget about your missions booklet. Pray for your missionaries. And if you don't know what to pray, ask Lou. He's got the outline. He's already prayed for it. Amen. But, um, but I trust that you'll do that. Now I hope the familiarity of this verse will not cause you to, oh boy, I know, I've heard this all my life. Let's stand, please. In honor of God's word, Matthew 28. And let me say also while you're standing, thank you so much again for your support of the U.S. church planting. And uh, my brochure, I think all of you got it, but they're, they're on the back table back there. Use it as a prayer guide. But also, if you, don't get, if you haven't signed up for my newsletter, I encourage you to do so. Right on the very back of it is the U.S. Church Planning website. You can go in there, sign up. Pastor gets it. and Well, Sue gets it. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor just passes it on to Sue. And, um, and sign up for it. And then when I do send it out, you'll get it. And you can keep up with what God's doing. You can go through there. One of my dear ladies in church, she takes care of the website free of charge, does it as a ministry, and she keeps it updated. We put the latest prayer letters of all the church planners on there. You can keep up with what God's doing, and I'd be honored to be able to send it to you. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We thank you, Father, for the reading of your word. We thank you for Sister Sarah and the challenging song she sang. We thank you for the hymns we've been able to sing, and we thank you now for the opportunity to look at your word. Challenge us. Stir us, speak to our hearts. And God, once again, you know my heart. And you know that I know, and I'm full aware, I can't, I can't do this without you. And I yield myself to you once again. Fill me fresh and anew, and do a work tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I believe that we're now in an opportunity like never before in missions. And i like us to liken us as we're in this century that we're in that to understand that, that we have an opportunity to do as a church and as an individual 
what few churches and few individuals have had that opportunity to do, and that is we most likely are what I would call the terminal generation. I believe we're very likely the last generation to have the opportunity to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. I really believe that. As you look at all that's going on in our world in light of Bible prophecy, and we know that there's no signs really given for the rapture of the church. There's many given for the second coming of Jesus. And the rapture occurs seven years before the second coming, because you've got the seven years, the rapture, and then the seven years of the great tribulation where there's death, disease, disaster, destruction upon this earth that this world has never known. And then Jesus Christ comes and physically he plants his feet on this earth. And he defeats and wins the battle at the Battle of Armageddon with not one sword, no atomic bomb, no weapons of artillery, just by his voice. And he wins the victory. And then for a thousand years, Jesus rules and reigns from the throne of David. And we, the believers, predicated in our faithfulness to God while we're alive, will be given positions of leadership in this world. And we'll be able to rule and reign with them. What an exciting thing that is to even contemplate. But you look at our world today and you see the mess that we're in and you see the direction that this world is heading in. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I believe it's not long. We need to do everything that we can to get the gospel. I believe that our churches today in America are really like the type of the church of Jerusalem where Jesus commanded them before he ascended up into heaven, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, but ye shall receive power. And after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. He gave them that command. But you know, the church in Jerusalem stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't go to Judea. They didn't go to Samaria. They didn't go to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's not until Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 8, verse number 1, that we find them going to their Judea, Samaria, and the world. And what did it take? Persecution. It's exactly what it took. And it seems like that the churches in America are just satisfied with maybe just reaching their little, their little Jerusalem and they're not that world mindset to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I commend you as a church and your pastor for leading you into a global vision of missions because that's what God commanded that we do is that we go to our Jerusalem, yes, but our Judea, our Samaria, and to the entire world all at the same time preaching the gospel telling people about Jesus Christ. So how are we going in this third millennium mission era? How are we going to do what God has commanded us to do? We may look at ourselves and say, man, we're not many people. But you know, we see throughout the Bible how God proved to us that little is much when he is in it. Remember Gideon's army? how God whittled that thing down to just 300. And then God said, okay, got it down where it needs to be. And God knew that if he didn't, that Gideon and others would take the credit because they had a massive army. But now, God was going to have to do something. I think, number one, if we're going to, to do and take the gospel, number one, we need to appropriate God's power. Notice verse 18. But ye shall re all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. That word power means authority. All authority, Jesus says, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And yet you look at the whole totality of the Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew stresses easily the authority of Jesus Christ. Over and over again, we see Matthew talking about the authority of his teaching. 
the authority of His healing, the authority of His forgiving sins, and His authority over the devil. Amen. Jesus has all authority. He has all power. And so, since He has all authority, since He is all sovereign, Jesus, the authority one, Jesus, the sovereign one, says to us as a church, I command you to go without fear. Do what I've commanded you to do. You look at your Bible. In essence, the Bible is a missionary book given to we as believers to be as Christians to have this missionary faith. Has it dawned on you that even the coming of Christ to earth was a missionary work? Luke 19.10, Jesus says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Even His coming was a missionary work. Even the first message at the birth of Christ it was a missionary message. Luke 2.10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. We find the first prayer that Christ taught his disciples. One of the very first prayers, Matthew 6.10, He said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. The first prayer is really a missionary prayer. Even the first disciple, Andrew, he was the first missionary. The Bible says in John 1 41, he first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah being interpreted the Christ. We find that the first command of the risen Savior was a missionary command. John 20, 21, Then Jesus saith unto them, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. We find the last marching orders of Jesus Christ was a missionary order. Matthew 28, 19, Go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So throughout the Bible, we have the, the missionary work, we have the missionary message, the missionary prayer, the missionary first missionary, we have the, the missionary command, and we have the missionary orders given by Christ. So I surmise what was last in perception on the lips of Jesus Christ when he departed, should be first and privilege and practice in the lives of his followers. Have to make it primary. We find, someone put it this way, a church without missions is a mission field itself. A church without missions is a mission field itself. So as Christians... Let us constantly be missionary minded and let us keep it ever before us locally and you'll see as the message progresses tonight locally, statewide, our United States and the uttermost parts of the earth. We've got to appropriate God's power. You know, it's evident, 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come into repentance. You know, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's God's will that people be saved. It's God's will. And yet, we just got to be faithful in giving out the gospel. I, I'm just elated and thrilled at your pastor and his willingness, even while he's walking. I just hope he don't die of a heart attack while he's doing it. But even as he's walking, that's not prophetic. That might be, you might say that's a pathetic statement, not a prophetic statement. And um, Sue, make sure he keeps up his life insurance policy, okay? And, um, but, <laughs> but you know, we need to get the gospel out. And Paul says, Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first. And also to the Greek, 
It's His power. We get the gospel to the world. But without God's power, we'll never be able to do what He's called us to do. We have to have His authority. And thank God, as our commander-in-chief, He's given us that authority. And everywhere we go, wherever we are, we need to make sure we have gospel tracts with us. Need to make sure that we give them out. Need, sure, some will throw them down. Sure, some will curse at you. But you know, I learned a long time ago, at first it offended me. But then I realized, wait a minute, they're not cursing at me. They're really cursing at Christ. They're not rejecting me. They're rejecting Christ. And I don't mean to be crude about this, but one day, if they don't get saved, they're going to stand before God, and God's going to remind them of every one of that mall that pastor gave a tract to, and they threw it down. They can never point a finger at God and say, you never told me. God will say, oh yeah, remember that Dr. Most Reverend Potentate Robert Boofer? He... <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he just looks like a potentate, you know? He just really does. And <laughs> oh, <laughs> God's going to say, no, on such and such day, at such and such a time, my beloved Pastor Boofer gave you a tract that told you about my love for you and my forgiveness of your sins and my gift of eternal life, and you threw it down. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. What terrible, sobering words to come forth from the lips of our God to a lost person that'll be doomed and damned for eternity forever and ever and ever. Oh, we've got to accept and appropriate the authority of God's power. We are representatives of the Most High God and what we give out is the power and the authority of the Word of God that pierces the hearts of men and women. What is it? Hebrews 4.12? But the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Oh, beloved, my words have no power my word really has no authority, but all oh, the word of Almighty God has that power, has that authority that will change and penetrate the hearts of men and women who need the Savior. Oh, let's appropriate God's power. I think number two, we must accept God's plan. What is this plan? Verse 19. Go, go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Mark puts it this way in Mark 16, 15. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every person, every creature, every individual. That's what we're to do. Every one of us knows somebody who's lost. You know, it's really simple. You know how, what is there, I, I think I counted 17 here tonight, counting our dove man up in the booth, and um, <laughs> he may be 18. But anyway, you know how we could have 36 Sunday if every one of us would not rest until we had somebody that's going to be here Sunday? Seriously. And then, man, we could double the next week if everybody else would go and do the same thing. We've got to get fervent and we've got to get on fire to want to see God do something in our midst and see God speak to hearts because you'll be able to reach people that pastor will never be able to reach. But you bring them in church. Let them preach the gospel to, to them. Let them just pour out a bucket of love on them of the love of God and see what God will do. We've got to accept God's plan. The answer to evangelization of this generation is the command that God gave 2,000 years ago. Its plan and its purposes have never changed, and we can complete the task if we will obey the complete command. He'll never tell us to do something that we cannot do. 
and we can complete it. But we're not going to complete it without obeying the complete command. What is that? God's plan. It's the Great Commission. It's divided in three simple little parts. Evangelism, baptism, and teaching. That's it. Doing what we can to get the gospel out and evangelize and tell people, God loves you. Jesus died for you. He rose from the dead for you. He offers you life and offers it to you abundantly. Oh, accept Him. Believe on Him. Receive Him. Be born again. Be saved. Come to Christ. And then get them in church. Get them in this baptistry. I remember when Ann Terpster painted that mural. And I, I can't believe, man, 40 years, well, probably 38 years ago. And there it is, still, still there. And, um, and yet, get them in the baptistry. And then the wonderful, beautiful task of teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Teaching them. Teaching them about the great command, com- commandment. Teaching them how to grow. I love 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Man, we got to teach them. We got to educate them. We got to train them. We got to disciple them. And we need to stick with them. Don't just get them in church and say, shoo, man, my job's done. No, keep an eye on them. And when they miss, you call them. You keep up with it. You keep bugging them. Just keep bugging them till they tell you to leave you leave them alone, and then try it one more time. <laughs> Amen. Don't give up because everybody's having a tough time, and you got to understand. Sometimes you bring somebody in church; they've never been in the church. They don't understand. And what I've discovered through the years is when they come in here lost or newly born again, they think all of you are perfect. You can tell they hadn't met Lou. So they think, they, think, they think all of you, I'm not going to pick on Reggie tonight. I don't think. I may. I may. We'll just see. But, um, but so they, they get saved. And you know, they're, they're a child of God. And just like a baby, when that baby is born into this world, that baby can't do anything. It can wee-wee and poo-poo and cry and sleep. That's about it. But then as, as you feed that baby, as you wash and bathe that baby, as you teach that baby, that baby begins to, to get off out of the diapers and in the regular underwear. Heard about this little boy went to the doctor. He wasn't feeling well. And the doctor said, I'm going to check you out. And he took his stethoscope out. And he said, listen, I'm just going to look in your heart and just see if Barney's there. The little boy said, no, Barney's on my underwear. Jesus is in my heart. <laughs> Don't you love children? They're just so special. But yet, that child will begin to walk. That child begins to run. That child learns to read and write and talk and gets educated. And after a few years, man, that child is a, 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 young, a young adult, then an adult. But yet, we're always learning. I'm amazed at Pastor. He's got three books on his desk right now that he's reading, and he's got three he's reading on. No wonder Sue looks miserable. He never talks to her. All he does is keep his nose in a book. <laughs> no, nah, she's always glowing. And, um, but you know, he's never stopped learning. 77 years old, and he's still learning. I think that's good. Be glad when he learns to be a gamecock, but but one day maybe that that kind of yes. I'm sorry, I hadn't said a thing all week long, <laughs> hadn't said anything all week long. But anyway, but uh, but you know we have to disciple these people. We have to stay with them and stay on them and encourage them and love them and and bring them into your house and fellowship with them, spend time with them and 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 do things with them and. Help them to grow into the believer that God wants them to grow into. So you have the evangelizing, you have the teach, the baptism, the teaching, and um, and teach them what God said. They didn't, and you got a whole book that tells them about it. You know, we live in a day and age where Bible doctrine and biblical authority is sort of shoved to the side, and it's sad. 
It's sad what some of these churches are preaching. They're, they're nice motivational speeches. And I need encouragement. I'll be honest with you, don't stone me, my pastor. But there are people I'll listen to on the radio. On XM, I have XM. And all I do is listen to Christian radio. I've got five stations on my first section of XM. Rest of them, stations I've got saved. I've got stuff when preacher's with me. And this rock and roll and country stuff that he likes to listen to. But when he's not with me, those, those five Christian stations, that's all I listen to. And I think, I, but I tell you, you're hard pressed today, be it television or be it radio, to find and hear a gospel message. I challenge you. Now what is the gospel? It's the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you'll hear a lot of good messages but you don't hear the gospel. And what concerns me, if the gospel, as the Bible says, is the power of God and the salvation, why are we not preaching the gospel? We need to preach the gospel. I never preach a message without giving the gospel. Never. I was told today, a broken-hearted um, mortician, funeral director, I've known him for years, years and years and years. I remember one time, he and I went out, we went and make a hospital visit one time. He was one of my deacons. And went in this hospital room, and the lady went, oh no! I, I, and seriously, I knew it was bad. Oh, it's got to be real bad. Started crying, the preacher and the coroner's here. He was also our coroner in, in the county. The preacher and the coroner's here. I know it's bad. I said, no, no, my dear sister. No, we're just out visiting together. Oh, I'm so thankful. Praise God, she said. <laughs> uh, yeah, amen. And uh, I tell you, people sometimes get the wrong message. You heard about the, the young little boy was staring at the pictures on the wall in the vestibule of the church. And, um, and he was just looking at the preacher and said, Hey, buddy, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm just looking at these pictures. What's this about? He said, Oh, that's all the members of our church who, who have died in the service. He goes, Wow. Was it the 8 o'clock or the 11 o'clock service? <laughs> oh, boy. But, uh, but children, man, there's something else. They, they really get you going sometimes. But, you know, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we need to teach them, disciple them, and you can't do it till you win them to Christ. When's the last time God has used you to win somebody to Jesus Christ? When's the last time you took the time to take your Bible and share the gospel with somebody and say them get saved. This, this mortician, this court, well, he's a funeral director now, owns his own funeral home. He said, preacher, he said, you know, I asked him, I said, how things going in your church? He said, oh, don't get me on that. I said, what? He said, man, he said, you know, since we got this new pastor, it's been years, we've had one person baptized in all of these years. I said, you are kidding me. He said, no. He said, it's sad. Don't even give an invitation. He says when he finishes his speech, he walks down off the platform, goes to the front pew, and turns his back to the congregation. And everybody dismisses. It's so sad. That church, I tell you, um, and I, I pastored there, and we built an 1,100-seat auditorium, $3 million paid for, and God was, matter of fact, my first, um, <laughs> I was there eight years. My first, thir my first three months, it was an old congregation. They, they were averaging 280 Sunday morning service before I came there. And my first three months, I had 16 funerals. He was, he was around me about the day. And then in the eight years, I buried 144 of the original 280 that were there. And so, if we wouldn't have grown, that church would have been running 140. But God got in it. God blessed. My very first service was on a Wednesday night. I'll never forget this. On Tuesday, I went out sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus, and led this young couple to Christ. And brought them, they came to church that Wednesday night. And um, they walked the aisle. And I gave an invitation. Everybody looked around. Invitation on Wednesday night? You're kidding me. And they walked the aisle and introduced them, told them, I said, 
uh, this couple accepted Christ this week and um, t- last night, Tuesday night, and they've come to make it public. They want to get baptized, come part of church. Then I told the people, I said, folks, this is how God's going to build this church. He wants to use us. He's given us the command to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's our calling and man, God got into that thing. We had over 600 saved in the eight years there. And this is a town of 7,500 people. So it wasn't a big town. And my last year, when I went there, there was averaging 280. The offerings were 6,800 a week. My last year there, we averaged 471 after losing 144 to deaths. 400, 421 and averaged $16,150 a week in the offerings. It's amazing. But you've got to... Do as the Bible says. You've got to go and teach all nations. You've got to make it an effort. And you've got to say, God, use me and God will. Hey, listen, God used a donkey. If God can use a donkey, I think he can use you. Amen. I mean, he did. Balaam's donkey. God used him. He can use us. So we've got to appropriate God's power. We've got to accept God's plan. Thirdly and lastly, we've got to acknowledge God's presence. Verse 20 says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. i never forget years ago, as you know, I used to fly. I quit, oh gracious, probably, I quit about 20 years ago when the price of fuel went so high because I never would let my dad pay for anything. Just wouldn't do it. And I told dad... Whenever it gets to the place where I can't afford it right then, I'm not going to do it. And I, I, my last flight, I never forgot, I was preaching in um, McAllen, Texas. I left my dad's airport in Columbia, flew out to McAllen. It was four hours there and three hours back because you always have a tailwind coming from west to east. And nine hours flying time, 1100 I, I'll never forget this, $1,138 just for fuel. And I walked into Dad's office at the airport, gave him the keys. I said, I just took my last flight. He said, what? I said, Dad, I can't afford this. I said, I could have gotten an airline, but I needed the time to stay current with my instrument rating. And I said, I just can't afford it. And I said, if God somehow, Lou, would you give me a million bucks? <laughs> if Lou would give me a million dollars, I'd start back flying again. And, uh, but uh, I've had two men offer me an airplane. Really have. And I told him, I said, man, that's wonderful. It'd be great. I said, but, you know, I don't have the funds to be able to insure it and to maintain it, to hanger it, keep it up, and to fuel it. I just, you know, right now I don't have it. Now, if you want to do all of that and give me the plane, I'll be glad to fly it for you. I just want to tell them. They didn't bite on that. But, um, but you know, I, 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 um, I don't even know how I got off on flying. But anyway, I miss it, though. I can tell you that right now. But as believers... We've got, oh, I know how I got off on it. My father-in-law, he's in heaven now. He passed away five years ago. He was 90. His wife, my mother-in-law, is 95 and healthy as can be. I mean, she, she'd probably walk circles around every one of you. I told my people the other Sunday, I said, man, because Mildred never misses. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they shop all day on Thursday. That's their shopping day. And um, I told them, I said, hey, if Pam passes away before Mildred does, I'm going to marry her. I was going to go and marry her, keep it in the family. And, uh, and I told her, I did tell him, I said, and we're going to have a miracle, baby. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure, I want to make sure that he's listening to me. <laughs> Pastor says, oh boy, one more night, my brother, one more night. And, um, but yet, we've got to acknowledge God's presence. Oda told me, I tried to get him to go flying. He let Pam fly with me. Pam and I would fly all over the place. And um, I said, come on, Mr. Riker, come and go fly. And he says, nope. And he says, uh, I said, why not? Are you afraid? He said, oh, no. He said, but the Bible talks against it. Now, I respect Oda Riker. That guy was a godly man. I said, don't tell me the Bible talks against flying. He said, I said, where? He says, Matthew 28, 20. God says, lo, I am with you always. He didn't say nothing about being with you up high. I said, oh, come on, man. And, um, but, you know, God's promised he'll be with us. We're not fighting a battle of flesh and blood. We're fighting a spiritual battle 
against wicked forces. And the devil will do anything and everything he can to stop us from doing what God's called us to do. So we need not fear. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Folks, God is on our side. He's with us, directing our steps. And we have the same master, the same mandate, the same message, and the same might that God has always given to His followers. We have got to accept it. We have got to acknowledge God's with us. And you know, as long as He's with us, you and God is a majority. Amen? And with God on your side as a church, there's no limit to what can happen here. But we've got to get back to the basics. And we've got to be mission-minded at home, our state, our country, and the world. But we can't neglect our home. We can't. I've been dealing with a church in North Carolina, I won't tell you where, and I know the pastor well. I've been preaching for him probably 25, 26 years. At one time, was a thriving church. Um, probably twice the size of this building. And um, beautiful piece of property. And yet, and bless his heart, he's a wonderful guy. And, you know, he's 85 years old. And he admits he drove to Columbia this week. No, last week, last, last Saturday. Drove to Columbia and wanted to sit down with me again. And he's been talking to me about taking the church and um, getting it going because they, they, they do good to have 20, 25 people. At one time, they had five, six, seven hundred people just a few years ago. And now it's just a handful of people. Thank God they have no debt. But he just says, you know, I just, it, it's, nothing's happening. He said, we have visitors come, but they, they don't come back. And... You know, his heart's broken, but he realizes, you know, I need help. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I've talked to my people about it. I'm not going to leave my church. You know, I'm, I'm there, and um, that's where God wants me. But I don't want to see a church fold. You know, and I, I thought about, well, we've got people that we could send and help out, and I've got preacher friends that, that could, we could share preaching time and, and hopefully get this thing back going again because... There's too many churches closing. And this at one time was a vibrant, growing, independent Baptist church in a neighboring city, in a neighboring um, state of North Carolina. And it's just, you know, sad to see what's taking place. But when that happens, though, you sort of lose your focus. And it's important that we stay focused on millennium missions, present day missions, doing, getting, tapping into God's authority and acknowledging God's plan and know that God's with us and if He be for us, who can be against us? Father, we love You. We praise You. We thank You for this time to just be reminded of the basics. Lord, help us as Christians, to be mission-minded, not just in our purse and money, but in our manpower. God, lay some lost souls on our heart. Lay some church members that are prodigals on our heart. And may we do everything we can to reach the lost and reach those that have strayed away and love them back to you, to your church. And then as we grow, we can do more for your kingdom worldwide. God, help us tonight to determine what we're going to do prayerfully, financially, and in going when it comes to missions. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor?